Jonathan Ross. I'm the CEO and founder of Grok. But back in 2012, I worked at Google, and Jeff Dean was about to give a presentation to the leadership team. And it was just two slides. The first slide was good news. Machine learning finally works. We actually have a speech recognition model that outperforms human beings. The second slide was bad news. We would need another 20 to 40 data centers to be able to afford it. And that was for speech recognition. If we wanted to do more, it was going to cost more. So that's why I started the TPU at Google. At Grok, we created the first and only pet op chip. How did we get there? We got there by doing things differently. A good example of this, we built on a 14 nanometer process when others were building on a seven nanometer process. We simply didn't need the bleeding edge lithography in order to produce the fastest chip. Instead of adding more transistors, our performance came from our architecture. So one thing we say at Grok is that the future isn't guaranteed. Everyone here believes Moore's law will run out. We talk about it, and no one is acting any differently than they did before. The real question is, what if ML Accelerator hardware doesn't get any better? So what are we doing about it at Grok? Well, we've introduced a new architecture. It's not an FPGA, it's not a CPU, and it's definitely not a GPU. It's something completely different. And we call it the TSP, or the Tensor Streaming Processor. Compute is a utility, like power. And the country that controls compute will be in an advantaged position. So recently, the Secretary of Energy invited me and others from this industry to discuss where the future of machine learning is headed. Everyone there had specific ideas of the future. My response was different. I said it could go one of several different ways, but what we do next as an industry will inform which direction it goes. That's what we mean when we say the future isn't guaranteed. The industry often focuses on faster speeds. That's what so many chip makers are focused on today. Everyone in this field is trying to make a faster chip. That approach of throwing more transistors onto a die means cost increases with incremental performance improvements. Following a trend that is running out of steam isn't a win for customers who are planning for the future. What we've done is come up with something revolutionary. I call this deterministic or predictable computing, a radically simplified approach which is scalable for customers. This is what enabled us to create the first and only PETA-OP processor. We said earlier that the future isn't guaranteed, but you do get the future that you stand up for. At Grok, we believe in the shortest path to performance. I'm ecstatic to say that our roadmap is fully funded, which includes our next chip. I'm very proud of our team, we broke records that still stand today with our first chip, and we're again on a path to shattering our own records. I'm excited about the innovation for the future, and we want to fuel that innovation with the best chip on the market for AI. But that means not just locking ourselves away in a lab and constantly crunching on performance numbers. We have to stand up for the future we want by creating new trends with our approach. Trends like inference being different than training, and actually being bigger than training, we focused on that first, but also batch size one, determinism and predictability and performance, and software first, which to us means the complexity and intelligence of a task is managed in the software stack. Defining these trends originated with what we're accomplishing at Grok, but more importantly, these are going to enable customers' AI applications in production that today are simply too costly. Next, I've asked a few guests to talk about their hopes and challenges for the future of AI. My name is Nicolas Sauvage. I'm the managing director of TDK Ventures, the corporate VC arm of TDK. At TDK Ventures, we're excited about the AI inferences platforms. This is the first time in our generation, actually in our lifetime, that the computing platform is not limited by the number of desks, offices, or even pockets someone can carry their smartphones. That means that it is an unprecedented opportunity to do a lot and to do many, many different use cases. And at TDK Ventures, we are excited not just for the data centers, but also for the automotives where predictable latency really matters for safety point of view. Hi, my name is Andrew Fersman and I'm the CEO of OneCubit. One of the things that we're really pleased to explore in the future of artificial intelligence are algorithms that have the ability to make use of context and that actually understand the world that they're describing. Hi, my name is Teddy Gleaser. I am a partner at D1 Capital. I head up our 
private and public efforts in the TMT space. We are focused on AI and machine learning opportunities and are therefore very excited to be participating today. We're investing in this space because we think the addressable market is massive already and going to grow rapidly for many years to come. It's impressive how far the market has already come and we're still in the early stages of semiconductor, effective semiconductor development. We're excited about the use cases across a broad array of verticals with a particular focus on healthcare and automation. Hi, my name is Igor Arsovsky. I'm the CTO of the ASIC business unit at Marvell. As a scientist, I've always been uh, interested in both biological and electrical systems, and I've been fascinated by the power, performance, and area efficiency of the human brain. As an engineer, it's true, I'm truly lucky to live in a time when many smart people are trying to close this gap between natural uh, and artificial intelligence. My small part in helping to narrow this gap is to help uh, uh, design and enable custom silicon for artificial intelligence. I'm personally excited about the future. Advancements like bioengineering, finance, government applications, and especially autonomous vehicles, because it will save lives. My cousin was a passenger in a car that got into an accident. The driver of the other car had been drinking, and he slammed into the side of my cousin's car. This didn't have to happen, and if we had autonomous cars, it wouldn't have happened. I want our chip in those cars, because we need the level of predictability that I know our chip can bring. But there's something else that AI brings you. When cars can make deliveries to you, when auto editing makes you a better photographer, when auto-sorting your inbox, or when speech recognition keeps an EMT's hands free so they can focus on their patient in an emergency. I know Silicon Valley has gotten a lot of criticism for focusing on convenience, but I'm not going to apologize for that. Whether it's a safety issue or convenience, time is a limited resource and we only get so much of it. What are the obstacles keeping us from that new reality? You're probably thinking about speed, but that's only part of the equation. Performance is a big challenge, but reliability, predictability, and certainty in the real world is key. Chip makers like us need to deliver that performance, not just in the lab, but also in the real world. With training, cost isn't an issue. Train the model once and use it as much as you want. With inference, each response has to be real time and it costs money and energy. That's a scaling issue. Now, instead of scaling with the number of ML researchers, you're scaling with the number of users and the number of queries. Inference at scale is harder than training. When I was at Google, roughly 80% of the ML models that were trained ended up having to be abandoned because they were too expensive to run in production. AI success is hinged on speed for inference as well as training, but for the workloads of the future, total cost of ownership is dependent on scalability. Just like when the team and I created the TPU at Google, and it saved billions of dollars. We as an industry have just begun tackling these challenges. If we look at the automotive use case, especially autonomous driving, one of the challenge is to be able to run a lot of AI inferences so that these autonomous driving models can run very fast for safety reasons but at the same time have a very low absolute power. And most cars cannot afford to have compute platforms that are above 100 watts. So having a really low power profile while having a very fast way of running the AI models is extremely important for this use case. At TDK, we really care about sustainability and environment. What that means is that we are looking at anything that could have a major impact to environment, not just today, not just in five years, but in 10 years and more. And when we look at the AI inferences market and, and the huge uncapped number of compute platforms that will be needed to run all these AI models, it's becoming very clear that whether it's five, 10 or 20 years, at some point, all these data centers will start to require more than 10%, maybe 20% of all power and CO2 uh, emissions. As a consequence, we really are interested to find solutions that can reduce power as much as possible while running the same AI model. We are very excited to see the industry starting moving forward with being much more power conscious 
so that the petahops per watt is becoming a very important KPI, not just for customers like on automotives, which I mentioned earlier, but also to make sure that this power consumption is as low as possible for the same output. And this will matter a lot for our environment. So I'm encouraging everyone listening to please take this very seriously. It's important. As one qubit pushes further into artificial intelligence, the bottlenecks that we come across are almost all computational. And that's why the unique architecture of Grok's processor is so important for our work. There is no question in my mind that there's going to be multiples of current demand over time. The biggest challenge is enabling machine learning technology outside of the data center. Significant infrastructure investment is needed to make a lot of use cases viable from a resiliency and latency perspective. Um, one major challenge in today's AI systems is when you look at AI accelerators, which typically push both performance, but at the same time try to drop the voltage as low as possible so they can achieve really high energy efficiency. Um, this tops per watt metric is kind of critical. Um, furthermore, the, these uh, accelerators um, typically get integrated into uh, data centers and automotive applications that are they have critical uptime um, and reliability requirements. And I know reliability is not as sexy as the tops per watt metric. Um, and because of that, it's taken a backseat to many AI discussions and many AI conferences. But reliability is really critical um, to deliver uh, useful uh, systems. Um, another challenge and opportunity is really advanced packaging. Um, a key difference between the current um, AI silicon solutions and the brain is the fact that semiconductors are typically built in these two-dimensional sheets uh, consisting of uh, many uh, three-terminal devices called transistors. And in contrast, um, the brain is really a three-dimensional structure that's built of neurons, which are also very highly connected. They have hundreds of terminals on them. Uh, in my opinion, it's this large compute volume and large connectivity that makes the difference between, um, between natural and artificial intelligence. So I think 3D uh, integration in semiconductors will play a large uh, part in helping us uh, narrow this gap between natural and artificial intelligence. Um, so in summary, I think there's a lot of great technical challenges, lots of opportunities on the horizon. I think it's truly an amazing time to be a hardware design engineer. And here uh, at Marvell, we're really excited to enable our customers uh, as they design the next generation of AI systems. So thank you. At Google, the team and I created the TPU for existing workloads that we could make better, as well as new and emerging workloads. The plan for the future means understanding those workloads. Those were yesterday's challenges, and we have new challenges today, like power efficiency. To Grok, those obstacles are the path, and that's where we're going. So how does Grok fit into such a big picture? As a startup, our innovation isn't despite our size, but because of it. I already mentioned that we have the world's first and still only single chip peta-op processor. We said the future isn't guaranteed, and you can see that with GPUs coming to their end of life as far as handling workloads of the future. This is what Grok and our TSP is providing to make sure we're on the right path for the future. But if you want to do inference, you have to do it in batch one. Batch one doesn't mean making 16 slices of a pie and only giving out one slice and throwing the other 15 away. That's not batch one. Batch one is making one slice when someone wants one slice and wasting nothing. This isn't just industrial automation or autonomous vehicles. It's data centers too. I know that because I'm one of the few people who's ever designed and built an AI accelerator that has been deployed at scale at a hyperscaler. This is what inference performance looks like. Running real-time inference on architectures that weren't designed for it is like filling a glass of water at your faucet and leaving it streaming as you walk away. Inference is small batch size. You can always run batch jobs overnight, but if you want to respond to real-time queries, you have to use batch size one. The future looks bright. Today we're shipping to our customers, both as individual PCIe cards and systems with eight cards each. And there's even more on the roadmap to come. I know 2020 has been a crazy year. Together we're pushing through and making great strides. Grok is going to grow our headcount by 4x by the end of next year. 
we're not going to lose who we are because it's the scrappy maneuverability that lets us innovate faster and more affordably than everyone else. That's how we built the first pet op chip, and that's how we're going to build what's next. So join us. Get on the fastest path to performance, and let's work together to guarantee a future we all want. Thank you for your time and watching today. And of course, if you want to know more, visit our website at grok.com.